Greg, thank you so much for coming on today. I really appreciate it. I'm excited to talk to you because I actually haven't had anybody on where we actually talk about gardening and creating food? our own food. Yes. Uh-huh. Like I've talked to people who have paleo, you know, chefs and written cookbooks, but nobody we've talked about like gardening and owning the process yourself. But did I see recently that you had Dr. Gundry on? Mm-hmm. Yes. Oh my gosh. I got chills because his work is so important to yes. all of this. Yep. All about you know, our immune system and yeah, Gundry's yes. work is amazing. Dr. Gundry. And I also, um, I think I, I released his yet. I'm not sure, but Dr. Bach, Kenneth Bach, I don't know if he, and his the same thing. It's all about food and your digestion. Yep. And I've been following him for 20 years. So when I got on, I was a little starstruck. I was like, oh my God, I can't believe <laughs> right? you're on. Yeah. I, I've been reading your books for 20 years. He's like, really? And I was like, yes, I yes. saw you in New York yeah. City 20 years ago. And he's like, oh my gosh. So I was these pioneers that just been kind of, you know, holding the flag when nobody else knew who they were right. and what was going on. And now it's yeah. becoming more aware, but they've been talking about this for 20 years. So I've, but, I've had a couple of those on my podcast. Yeah. Where it's I was gr- a little starstruck. So I understand. Yeah, that. it was great. And you know what? what's great is because I, like 20 years ago, I knew about GMOs mm-hmm. and I've been like telling my friends GMOs and like, what are you talking about? Like, so for yep. me, I've always been like researching it because I've always had a compromised immune system. And so I've kind of, you know, take it on myself. I'm just not a gardener. So I haven't, t- I've, I've attempted <laughs> to create my own garden. It uh-huh. just didn't work. So that's why I was excited to talk to you today because I was hoping you could simplify it for us people who are not, we're challenged when it comes into the gardening department. Yeah. But anyway, so I'm excited to have you on. And what's also neat about it is that you've also had Lyme. So you understand uh, yes. the process, like what we're all going through and that what led you to what you're doing today. So yeah. can we start out with just you talking about your Lyme journey a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. So for the first 15, 16 years of my Lyme journey, I hadn't a clue that it was Lyme. Back in 1999, maybe not even 1998, I went to the doctor with this gnarly shake on my right side. They called it an essential tremor. It's mm-hmm. just on my right side. For those of you on video, you can see my hand shaking. I'm not doing that. That's just my hand shaking. So it makes it hard to. Oh, you still have and, that now? Oh, yeah. Oh, in spades. Oh, my goodness. Absolutely. Have not been able to get rid of that at you all. You need to go to my doctor. We'll talk later about that. I went and got hyperthermia that treated my neurological Lyme. Oh, interesting. Because I all couldn't right. walk in a straight line. Oh, my gosh. So, 98, 99, I was diagnosed with something called an essential tremor. And oh, at the same time, I had cicadas. I hear cicadas in my ears 24 7. Right now, I'm hearing cicadas. About three years later, I went and tried again, went to Barrows Neurological Institute, and they looked at me and they said, Oh, yeah, that's just a benign essential tremor. There's nothing we can do about it, but here's a drug. It's like, Yeah, I haven't been on drugs since the 70s, so no. And you know, I went on with my life. I'm an entrepreneur. I've had 30 different businesses in my life. Some of them lasted 20 years. Uh, some of them lasted 30 days. But that's what I do. So, you know, it's just, for me, it became a new way of being. You know, I have this shake and, oh, well. And 2014 rolls around. And my partner, Heidi, gets a bullseye rash. Now, we're in Phoenix, Arizona. She got bit by a tick in Phoenix, Arizona. Wow. We had no idea what that was. Didn't have a flipping clue. So this was in the spring of 2014. By August of 2014, she's literally in the emergency room trying to figure out what's going on with her. It's getting so bad. She self-diagnoses. She's so good at that. She self-diagnoses. She goes back to the emergency room doctor and says, Test me for Lyme. So they didn't know the emergency room doctor had oh, never God, seen no. it. Oh, God, no. Wow. Oh, God, no. In fact, when she was in the emergency room, they told her she was crazy. You don't have Lyme. There's no Lyme in Arizona. Right. And they ran a test, and guess what? She had Lyme. She had Lyme. So they, at her prompting, they put her on 10 days of antibiotics. And by that point, it had advanced. So we're you know six months into it at this point. So 10 days of antibiotics later, she comes off of the antibiotics and three days later, she's in crashes again. Crashes and is in the hospital. She was in the hospital for nine days. She had seven different doctors tell her after her positive Lyme test, had seven different doctors and 
including two neurologists, that she couldn't possibly have Lyme. Lyme doesn't exist in Arizona. So we get her better enough to get her out of the hospital and take her out to this place out in Scottsdale that's you know supposed to be known for treating Lyme. And they said, yeah, we can treat it, no problem. We'll put in a, what do they call it, a pick? Mm-hmm, uh, that's what I in, had, yep. Yeah, a permanent. And um, oh, by the way, the treatment is $70,000. I know, it's like $2,000 a week, at least for me it was, for yeah. the antibiotics. And you know, she just, you know, I was pissed at them and because they kind of said, oh yeah, come on in, we can help you, no problem. We'll get it handled. And we get there and it's 70 grand. And she just broke down and crying. And so we went away, she did more research. And we actually found a Lyme nurse practitioner in our neighborhood. Oh, really? So obviously there's enough Lyme that there's a Lyme nurse practitioner or was she only doing Zoom? No, 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 no. Remember, this is 2014. This is pretty much pre-Zoom. Oh, it has to be pre-Zoom, yeah. Yeah. No, at this point, this Lyme practitioner is buried in Lyme cases in 2014 in Phoenix, Arizona. She was getting two or three new ones a week. So I go in with Heidi the first time and, and she looks at me and she says, Greg, have you been tested for Lyme? It's like, no. Why would I be tested for Lyme? Well, first of all, you know, my partner and I are sexually active. And, right, because right? there's a, that, another theory that because it's part of the syphilis family, why wouldn't it be sexually transmitted? Exactly. So she sends off this test to a place in Washington, the, the good place for Lyme Hygenics? testing. Hygenics? Hygenics, thank you very yeah. much. And my Lyme test comes back as positive. And she looks at it and she says, Greg, how long have you had Lyme? Oh, because your titers are so high or something like that. Exactly. Yeah. Because they can tell so, like how long you've had it based on... Exactly. This is So at that point, I would have had a new case that, you know, if it would have been because of Heidi and I had been sleeping together, yeah. you know, it would have been a fairly new case. And the titers came back as very old. I don't, you know, I don't understand the test and how that works. But she said, Greg, you've had Lyme for a long time. And then I started expressing my symptoms and she yeah, said, oh, the, yeah. yeah, you have it. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Oh, and the other piece of it was though, back in August, Heidi says, Greg, I think I have Lyme. And I said, well, tell me what are the symptoms? And she was telling me rattling off these symptoms. I said, you can't have Lyme. I'm having those same symptoms. Crazy. So what we think happened is that uh, I had previously had Lyme and then she reinfected me with one of the other versions of it. So I was having some of the same symptoms that she was having. Right, right, right. So that's kind of how it happened. At that point, were you already farming and doing? Oh, yeah. So you were already doing this. Like you were already eating super healthy and into this healthy world. This was not because of Lyme. No, 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 no. No. I I wrote a paper in the eighth grade. I was uh, 14. It was 1974 on how we were overfishing the oceans. In 1981, I was on the board of the Arizona Aquaculture Association, and we visited non-sustainable farms here in the state, and it was ludicrous what they were doing. They were harvesting the fish. They were throwing away 70% of the extra stuff. And so I looked at that model, and it's like, there's got to be a better way. So I designed what we would now call a regenerative fish farm in 1981 on paper, where everything in the system gets used. Mm -hmm. Because that's just what made sense to me. And then in 1991, I discovered permaculture, the art and science of working with nature. And for me, it was, oh my God, there's something to call the way that I think. Because I think regeneratively. I don't like the word sustainable. Sustainable simply sustains the mess we've created. Yeah. Regenerative puts in systems like natural systems that regenerate themselves over time. And that's right. really what we're trying to do. I'll bring this right back to line. That's really what we're trying to do with our health. And I don't believe that we, so let's talk COVID just for a minute. I don't think we really have a COVID problem. I think we have an immune system problem. And while Lyme is very real, I think a big part of Lyme is our immune. negatively impacted immune system. Yeah. So that's why some people get bit and can't get better, right? And 80, you know, 20% right. of people can't get better because there's immune, they're immune compromised for other exactly. reasons. If it's a toxic overload or if it's mold or if it's parasites, yep. whatever, it, it does that. So obviously you, you have not gotten completely better because you still have some neurological problems, but are you feeling better otherwise? Yeah, mostly I feel better. It's, and you did all herbals and supplements and- Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
homeopathic supplements, that kind of stuff. I still get glutathione shots to help improve my immune system. Recently, I got a COVID vaccine just because I'm not a person to get vaccines. In fact, the last shot I had was in the 90s. I got something. And you um, felt and fine after it? After the COVID? I did. After the vaccine? I did, yeah. But we actually did, with this practitioner, we actually did an immune system test. They can actually oh, take they can blood. Test it before. Oh, Exactly. So both Heidi and I got our immune system tested. And then we waited six weeks and we worked a little bit more on our immune system. I think a big piece of this is immune compromised issues. And I think we as a culture, I have this theory that my mom, who passed away when she was 85, lived on the planet about 25 or 30 years where it was really polluted. So, you know, she had a pretty good, healthy life until she was 85. Mm -hmm. Me, I've been on a planet for over half of my life, and I'm having some of the same health issues that my parents had at 80 and 85 now. at 60. And our kids are going to have it in their 20s. We're already seeing that. My yeah. nephew was diagnosed. He was diagnosed with celiac at the age of 12. Wow. Now he was born in 1999. That's and because of, you know, all the crazy GMO and the wheat. Like exactly. I don't really think we're having a wheat gluten problem. It's we're having a GMO problem. If you ask me exactly. personally, like, I think if you exactly. could find clean wheat, it's very different than having, it's the GMOs well, that's, that we're allergic to. It's yeah. Like, well, and there's a whole movement. There's a whole movement on the clean wheat. Hayden flour mills contracts here in Arizona contracts with all kinds of growers to grow the ancient grains in Rocky Mountain Seed Alliance has a whole grain trial program. They're a nonprofit and they're actually encouraging people to grow ancient grains and it's working. Right. Go figure. Right. Right. And then you also look at Europe, right? Like you go to Europe, the wine doesn't have all the, the right? tannins in it or whatever you call it. Yeah. And then also the bread, right? You can eat bread yep. the entire vacation and not gain yep. any weight. Don't feel what exactly. bad. Exactly. And it's because they don't have all the preservatives and all the GMOs and everything else. Well, and you know, GMOs are one thing, but here's the thing that li listeners may not know. Roundup is sprayed on non-organic grains. And the last thing that the farmers are encouraged to do is to spray a good dose of Roundup on their crop when it's ready to harvest. Did you know this? No. They have to have the wheat dried up before they can harvest it. So what they do is they spray it with Roundup, which kills it immediately, then they can harvest it immediately. And we're taking in those toxins when we eat non-organic wheat. So people who don't know, like GMOs, it's genetically modified organisms. Mm -hmm. Monsanto, the devil, created it. And so if you could just tell, I mean, I, I understand, but if you could explain to people why it's so bad, right? How they've injected... Right. So basically, there's multiple kinds of GMOs. And GMOs, genetically modified organisms or transgenic organisms, basically what they're doing is they're taking a gene from a fish and they're putting it in tomatoes. That was done. They stopped doing it because it didn't work. But basically, they're moving genes transgenically from one species to another. This is not something that happens in nature. Mm -hmm. And I'll have to be honest with you. I don't know whether this is a good or bad thing. The science hasn't really proven whether moving genes is a good or a bad thing. That's from a scientific perspective. Do I personally believe it's a bad thing? I think it's a bad thing. But the thing I have the biggest problem with is that these companies are doing this and they're putting it out in the public domain without testing it. So what happens is, is they do this genetic alteration and they put it out there in corn. Guess what? The corn pollen has this genetics in it that now pollutes other corn. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's said that there uh, is probably no such thing as organic corn on the planet anymore no. because of that. Yeah, and that is, that is highly irresponsible. That's highly irresponsible. So what they're doing is they're doing this transgenic work to be able to do different things. So one of the things that they've done, which is, I believe, has helped create the celiac disease, is they've taken a naturally occurring bacteria called Bacillus thuringiensis, or BT. And BT is sprayed organically 
to kill caterpillars. And what it does to the caterpillars is that it degrades, listen very carefully, it degrades their digestive system and kills them. Yeah. So what they've done is they've made genetically modified BT corn. So when I use BT in my garden, and I have some in the cabinet over here that I use on my grapes occasionally, it's naturally occurring. It's organic. But what they've done is they've taken a synthetic version of it and they've injected it in every single cell of this corn so that when a caterpillar comes along and chews on this corn, they're chewing on BT. So rather than getting, you know, people ask me if it's safe to use BT in my garden. It's absolutely safe. What makes it not so safe is that it's now in every single cell of that corn. Mm -hmm. So if you're eating that corn or if often corn is made for cow feed, animal feed, right? So all of a sudden, these animals are getting BT corn in every bite that they're eating. And then if you're eating non-organic corn, it's likely that there could be some of that in it. Mm -hmm. So it, 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 yeah. You I have a question to ask you. When it goes this. back to the meat, if you're eating like organic beef, mm -hmm. can they have fed that cow that BT corn, even though it's organic beef, or does that exclude it? That should. You'll have to check with the organic standards, but I believe, I don't know this to be a fact, but I believe that they cannot feed it non-organic feed. If it's going to be an organic cow, it has to have organic feed. I know that's the case mm -hmm. for my chickens. Yeah. You know, so. Right. Okay. So talk to us about your business and what you do and how you help people teach them about how to start <laughs> gardening and farming for themselves. So I've actually been growing food since 1974. That's, I don't know, 50, what, some years ago. I don't know why I had to start growing food when I was 15. But one of the things that I've noticed, and I'll get back to your, specifically to your question, but one of the things that I've noticed is with my compromised immune system of Lyme and who knows whatever else is there, if I eat something, like if I eat non-organic bread, I know within a couple of hours, if I eat something, one of my favorite things to drink, absolutely one of my favorite things to drink is a Coke. I love Coke. Absolutely love Coke. In fact, the ones from Mexico actually have sugar in them. Yeah, those are better right? for you, right? Right. Well, they're somewhat better for you because they just have sugar. I haven't had a Coke in like 10 years because if I drink six or eight ounces of Coke or any soda for that matter, it shows up that fast. I am sensitive enough. If I, I, so the other night, I love wine. I absolutely love wine. And so the other night I had two glasses and I know better. I know better. But the other night I had two glasses of white wine. It was a nice sparkling, you know, it's summertime. It's, you know, it was a nice time for, and I was miserable within about 18 minutes. That fast? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it happens that fast for me. So, See me? I'm the next morning. Oh, yeah. Well, the next morning was... I can drink two ounces of wine and get a little buzz going. And I don't know that that has to do with the wine. I'm just a lightweight when it comes to that. But if I eat or drink something that doesn't agree with me, I know within 20 to 30 minutes... And so what I've had to do, and this goes back to your question, what I've had to do is I've had to get really good about what I put in my body. And COVID was a gift because I used to eat out pre-COVID. I used to eat out maybe five times a week. And I had my certain places around town that I could go. And I knew exactly if I eat that, I'm not going to feel bad. But if I eat that, I'm going to feel bad. And with COVID, Heidi and I just, we started cooking at home. And for the past year, for the most part, I've eaten at home three times a day. People ask me of my landscape. I have an edible landscape here at the urban farm and there's always something to eat. And people ask me how much of our food do we get out of the yard? And, you know, maybe 20, 30% on a year over year basis. There's always something to eat. I'm constantly harvesting something out of the yard for one of my meals. For lunch today, I had eggs from the organic chickens. And 
what I found is that if people are paying attention to what they're eating and how they feel, if you keep a, a diary, a food diary of what you eat, you'll notice. You'll start seeing these subtle shifts in how you feel over time. Mm -hmm. You know, is, is eating food giving you a headache? Yeah. Is it giving you indigestion? Is it giving you heartburn? You know, these heartburn commercials, I have to laugh at them because heartburn is in a lot of cases, I'm not a medical doctor. I don't know this to be a fact, but my opinion is, is that in a lot of cases, heartburn is what are you eating? Yeah. And so much you fatigue know, though, right? Like for me, I find be, like, yeah. like yesterday I was like, okay, I'm going to juice. And I, I don't know why I did this, but I had like two big <laughs> glasses of watermelon juice. Uh -huh. Oh my God. I think it was just too much sugar. I, I like oh, had to lay yeah. down. It just was too, I, I was like, yeah. I couldn't even keep my eyes open. It was just yep. too much sugar for my system. Yeah, exactly. And those are the kinds of things we need to start, you know, looking for. So I'm a big proponent of organic, not surprise, surprise. And I've actually felt better over the past year eating exclusively at home and eating exclusively organic. Because, you know, when we go to, to the farmer's market yeah. and, you know, the grocery stores, we only buy organic. And, you know, you shop on the outside of the grocery store, stay away from the processed food. So really, my business is about educating people around food and how to grow their own. Because I believe the single most important thing that we can be learning right now is where our food comes from. Mm -hmm. and how to grow our own. Do you know what food miles are? No. Food miles are the amount of miles that food travels oh. from where it is grown to your plate. The average food miles, what would you guess the average food miles in the United States is? Oh, I would say a couple thousand because I think a lot of it comes from overseas. Yep, exactly. Somewhere between 1,500 and 2,500 miles. See, yep. and uh, I'm sure Dr. Gundry spoke to this too, there's something called the lectin in food. Mm -hmm. And as food ripens, these lectins start to disappear. So let's talk about a peach. And a peach that is picked in Peru and shipped to the United States. That peach has to be picked when it's not ripe. Because if you pick a ripe peach, by the time it makes it into the box and into the factory, it's going to be dead. Peaches need to be eaten right when you pick them off the tree. So the thing is, is that an unripe peach is high in lectins. If you pull it off of the tree, you have just discontinued the ripening process of this peach on the tree and discontinued the reduction of those lectins. Plus, the second thing that happens is you pick that peach when it's not ripe, it's sitting in a box and it travels. The moment you pick something, it starts degrading nutritionally. So when you're eating food that is picked 1,000, 1,500, 2,000 miles away, first of all, there's a nutritional deficit when it's picked. It degrades nutritionally so that when it gets to you, the nutrition value is a lot less than the apple tree that you see in back of me in this picture. If I go pick an apple off of that tree when it's ripe, the lectins have mostly disappeared the nutritional value has skyrocketed. Have you ever taken a bite of something and it's like, oh my gosh, that is the best of the best mm -hmm. of the best, right? When you go like strawberry picking yourself and you're like, I'm not going to wait till I get to the car. I just want to eat it out here. <laughs> exactly. The nutrition, when it ripens on the vine, it's most nutritionally dense. It's best for you that way. And it tastes good. Mm -hmm. There's this whole thing called a Brix meter, B-R-I-X. And I know that they use them in the winemaking industry to measure the nutritional sweet density of grapes for wine. You can do that with food as well. A friend of mine who used to live with me 20 years ago had a bricks meter, and he would measure the bricks ratings out of our food here at the urban farm. And it was through the roof when we were harvesting things when it was ripe and ready to eat. So, Can I um, ask you a quick question? So how do please. they get it from... They pick the, the peach, it's not ripe, it travels. How do they get it to ripen? Does it stop or does it ripen in the box or do they spray it? So I've heard that there are ethylene, I think it's ethylene gases that they gas them with to make, mm -hmm. them, make them ripen. So here's the thing. We have an amazing food delivery system in this country. 
we have a food delivery system that feeds 300, over 300 million people a day, you know, 330 million people a day. It is a masterful system. If you think about it, we're delivering a billion meals a day in the United States. That's pretty masterful. The thing that people aren't paying attention to is exactly what happened a year ago when COVID hit and the grocery stores shelves went empty. This goes back to my most important thing that we need to figure out where our food comes from and how to grow our own Mm -hmm. because we have a three-day supply of food in any grocery store. It's called a just-in-time model. And again, we saw it happen actually twice in the past year with the pandemic, mostly around toilet paper, go figure. But there were also grocery stores that I went into when the pandemic started where the shelves were empty. And with the storm in Texas, Mm -hmm. grocery store shelves empty. We need to be figuring out how to grow our own food. And the cool thing is, is it's really easy to grow your own food. Hold up your thumbs for me. They're not brown. I promise. You can have a green thumb. (laughs) You just need to know the rules. Growing your own food is really simple. It's really simple. You just need to know the rules. And where do you live? Connecticut now. You're in Connecticut. I'm in Phoenix, Arizona. Your rules are different than my rules. So if you're going to grow food where you're at, you have to know the rules for where you live. If you move from Connecticut and you're a master gardener in Connecticut, you are a master at growing things in Connecticut. You come to Arizona and try to use those rules. eh, You're going to say, oh, I have a brown thumb now. Wrong. You don't have a brown thumb. You just need to know the rules. And so a lot of the education that we do online through Urban Farm U is teaching people the rules or how to decipher and figure out the rules for your area, because it is super simple. And the easiest thing to grow and the most expensive thing to buy, what do you think that is? I was going to say tomatoes, but I don't know. Tomatoes are fairly easy to grow, but they take a little bit more effort. Herbs. Oh, you know, yes, you you're right. The herbs, right? that's the only thing I actually do know how to grow because I use them all the time. So that's the only thing I always go to because like, it costs so much money for mint and mint is right. like a weed. And mint is a weed. Exactly. <laughs> I have a garden bed in my backyard that has a weed in it. It's taken over the bed. It's got to be six foot by 20 feet long and it's mint. Yeah. They're, it's it just, just invasive. It right. just takes over. So grow basil. You can grow basil in a pot on a sunny windowsill. Yeah. I use basil practically every day here at the urban farm when I have it growing in the yard. Oh, that's great. So it's true, but you touch on a point where I think it's super important is that we need to be self-sufficient going forward. I think there's two things that came out of this um, pandemic. It's one, it's like, if you don't have two sources of income and you're relying on your company and you don't have like stacked up savings, you're in trouble, right? The government's not coming to save you. Oh no. So, yeah, so yeah. you need to have like a second source of income or a good six month lead time of being able to financially take care of yourself. And two, I think you need to be able to be able to sustain yourself like food wise, if it's seeds, yep. if it's yep. something. Yep. Most important thing we can be doing right now, figuring out where our food comes from and how to grow our own. Mm-hmm. No, it's I, true. I was mentoring a guy earlier today. I, I get occasionally, I get interesting emails from people. And so he called me today and he says, Greg, you know, I, I struggle with going to work with somebody for somebody else. And I've been self-employed for 45 years. I've had a couple of jobs along the way. And he asked me something about going to work and I work for somebody else. And I said, that's really hard for me. It's for me, it's selling my soul. Cause he asked about the risk factor of working for yourself. For me, it's less risky to work for myself than it is to go to work for somebody else. Mm-hmm, Cause you'd be laid off tomorrow. Whereas like, it's up to you to make. Right. That's another thing. I have, I've been self-employed for 45 years. I've never missed a rent payment. I've owned a house for 32 years. I've never missed a house payment. The never turned off the electricity. That was all me. I had to figure that out. Mm-hmm. And, you know, there were some times that I was eating ramen-ish along the way. Yeah. But I always figured it out. Right. You know. You need to figure it out on your own. But then that's yeah. important for, you know, getting kids back. You know, it's funny. I went to a school called um, IIN in New York City to become a holistic health counselor. And this was back um, like 13 years ago. And at the time, he was trying to encourage all of us to try to get gardens in the schools. 
And at that point, <laughs> nobody had gardens. There you go. But look, yeah. at now 13 years later, I would say, I don't know, maybe half the schools have gardens. You go to any kind yeah. of school, or well, at least where I've gone. I mean, in mm. LA, even like LA, where our school, because I, I just moved from LA, even our ele- elementary school where we didn't have a grass patch, they planted in our backyard like a cute little garden. I mean, I felt like it was so much more prevalent than it was 13 years ago. Like, I feel like every town or every other town has farmer's markets now. Right. But they oh, didn't yeah. 13 years ago. Nope, that is so, the case. So, you know, it's definitely becoming more aware. People know what GMOs are. They're demanding it. You can get organic and, you know, Costco and Walmart. So we're getting there, you know, we're getting there. But but being able to take care of yourself, I think is the most important, yeah. right? And you yeah. save a lot of money, like you just said. So instead of All spending right. $10 yeah. on basil, you're going to spend $10 on a basil plant that's going to keep giving you basil right. all summer. Yeah, exactly. Often what we'll do when we go to San Diego on vacation, one of the grocery stores that we go to, Boney's in Coronado, they usually will have an organic basil plant that we can Mm. buy. So we actually buy the basil plant, use the basil for a week, bring the plant home and stick it in the ground when we get home. Oh, that's great. That's a good idea. Yeah. So Greg, this has been amazing. Is there anything we haven't covered that you think we should be covering? How much time do we have? (laughs) <laughs> Whatever you want. I know, right? Uh, yeah. So growing your own food, it is simple. And one of the key factors in success for growing your own food is knowing how to create healthy soil. Building healthy, organic, nutrient-dense soil is the key to a brown thumb going to a green thumb. And so I actually have a a series of videos on that at healthysoilhacked.com. If anybody's interested, you can go there and sign up for that and get the videos on creating healthy soil. The other thing is don't overwhelm yourself. I do tours here at the urban farm. The urban farm is my house. It's a third of an acre right in the middle of Phoenix. And I've been gardening here for 32 years and we do tours and it's pretty dense here food wise. I have a food forest that is amazing here at the urban farm. And I had a young lady on tour maybe six years ago. And we go from the front yard because there's a lot of food growing in the front yard to the backyard. And she stuck up her hand in the backyard and sheepishly said, oh my gosh, where do I start? And I looked at her and I said, first of all, take a deep breath. What you're seeing here at the urban farm is a process of 25 plus years of work. This doesn't happen overnight. So that's one thing. The next thing is pick one thing. Don't try and convert your entire landscape to edible. Right. Pay attention to your yard for a year and pick the perfect place to put a five by five garden. Or as we did this year, plant your front porch with edibles. You know, Heidi, my partner, has all these great flower pots on the front porch. Well, this year with COVID, last fall, we said, let's just plant food on, in the pots on the front porch. So we did that. And we harvested an amazing amount of food out of the pots on the front porch. So what I encourage people to do is don't overwhelm yourself. Because what happens is if you overwhelm yourself, you get discouraged. And you say, oh, I've got a brown thumb. I, gotta, I can't do this. But if you pick one thing. Get really good at it. Grow basil in a pot on your windowsill. Get good at that. That is simple. And then do pots on your front porch. And then maybe put in a five by five garden, but do it step by step. Because if you overwhelm yourself, you'll discourage yourself and you'll quit doing it. And the last thing we need right now is people getting discouraged around gardening. Very well said. I I appreciate all your suggestions and comments. This has been amazing and I really appreciate it. And I'm definitely going to check out Urban Farm and try to plant something. You got me inspired. Maybe tomorrow, oh, Saturday, good. I'll go out and, and go get my basil. Nice. Um, <laughs> so my thank website, you so much. Sure. My website's urbanfarm.org. I've been doing it for the website for over 20 years and you can find all kinds of information there. Great. Thank you. Thanks for having me.